Thank you, Owen. Uh, good morning, everyone, for being here. Um, I hope you've had your coffee this morning, uh, and if you do fall asleep, please try not to snore too loudly so your neighbors will, can still enjoy the presentation. Um, has everyone been having a good time at the conference? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've, I think these presentations so far have been amazing. Um, and I've been learning, really learning a lot, and uh, I feel really lucky to be here. So thank you, everyone, for inviting me to be here. Today I'll be talking about uh, the language development and cultural identity amongst third cultural kids, or TCKs. So what do I mean exactly by TCKs? Well, um, the most widely accepted current definition for the term is the following. A third culture kid is a person who has spent a significant part of his or her developmental years outside their parents' culture. The TCK builds relationships to all of the cultures while not having full ownership in any. Although these elements from each culture are assimilated into the TCK's life experience, the sense of belonging is in the relationship to others of a similar background. This definition is provided by David Pollock and Ruth Van Rieken uh, from their book Third Culture Kid, which you can see on the right. Um, the experience of growing up among worlds. And although the term wasn't originally coined by them, it was through David Pollock and Ruth Van Rieken that this term really raised a prominence. And it's my belief that TCKs are citizens of the future in our increasingly global world. So basically, it's when someone is born in one culture, their home culture, or first culture, uh, but then moves somewhere else and grows up for, a sm for some time in a second culture, their host culture. So the TCK thus has to navigate between both cultures, and as they do, they develop a sense of identity and cultural norms that is neither the first nor the second culture, but rather somewhere in between. And that creates that third circle there. Um, this in-between area creates the third culture and usually has shared commonalities uh, of those living internationally mobile lifestyles. This social cultural identity is incredibly important for our increasingly global world. Uh, as the number of expats raising their children overseas keeps on increasing. In 1990, for example, the US Census reported 922,000 federal workers and families living overseas. In 2007, the number increased to over 4 million. And those are just Americans. There are obviously many perks and advantages of, to being able to live abroad, travel abroad, and have a rich intercultural upbringing. But there are also a lot of challenges and hardships that TCKs face. I would like to read to you an anonymous mother's account of her experience raising a third culture kid. My daughter celebrated her 14th birthday by going out with her best friend for lunch and a spot of shopping. She had a great day out, a large slice of chocolate cake, and bought herself a little gift with her pocket money. On her return, she unwrapped a small package and locked herself in the toilet. She took the pencil sharpener out, dismantled it, and used the blade to carve a deep cut into her leg. Fortunately for this mother, her daughter told her right away that she was prone to self-harming tendencies, which resulted in her being sent to live in a boarding school in her home country. The mother recounts that the school was good for her and helped her manage the self-harming tendencies, especially since she was able to start setting down roots and didn't have to keep on moving. But why? Why did her daughter self-harm? Was it her TCK lifestyle? Or was it simply the result of a difficult childhood, which could happen anywhere? Her mother suggests it could have been both. Her daughter described the bullying which led to cyberbullying coming even from her teachers in some places. Bullying happens everywhere, and adolescence is a difficult time for everyone, regardless of where they are. But it's worth considering how being a TCK may have played a part in this. Much of the bullying she experienced was based on her not looking the same as most other kids in her school and being too stupid to speak the language. And that was only after moving there for two weeks. She simply couldn't fit in. More than that, she grappled with the question of knowing where home was. This form of self-harm, although terrible, could have been worse. Depression is quite often reported among TCKs, and the worst cases can even result in suicide. One TCK, Steph Yu, shared her account in 2008 on Dennis and Mag, a TCK online magazine. I had only known Caleb for three months before he died. We were just getting past the stereotypes. Him, a tall, blonde, cheery kid from Hong Kong. Me, a not tall, Asian, cheery kid from Singapore. We were both third culture kids, working as dorm residents, attending university far from home. At Caleb's memorial, his dad read his suicide note. I'm sorry, Caleb wrote. I've been living a lie. I collapsed into tears. Until that moment, I refused to believe that it was so suicide. We were so alike. We were international, third culture. We joked about how we hated answering, where are you from, and the stereotypes put upon us. We were smart, worldly, well-traveled. Why suicide? That was 2005. 
Today I'm still seeking answers to questions that I'm afraid to ask. I still don't know why Caleb decided to leave. But I'm sure of one thing, third culture kids need a lot of support when they leave their expatriate communities. Depression obviously isn't exclusive solely to TCKs. It happens all over the world. And there are mul always multiple different causes that are attributed to it. But amongst TCKs, it's possible to guess what some of the causes might be. Like how the foreign cultural bubbles they reside in leads to a disconnect between them and the local society. Like how they're constantly losing friends, their homes, their schools, and the world that known to them when they move. And how it happens not once, but every time they need to relocate. And for some cultures, such as Asian cultures in the East, there might even be a need to suppress the feelings of the individual for the communal good. So, and suppressing and hiding depression can often make it worse. Alan Mahoney, founder of Sea Change Mentoring, also experienced depression for seven years and even had a friend who committed suicide. She shared her thoughts about TCKs and depression in an interview for the blog Chris Cost Culture. Really what depression is, is when we have a feeling and internalize it. Sometimes in affluent and also expat communities, you can't show that you're upset or angry. What will other diplomats say? What will the company say? You might get kicked out of the country. In most Asian cultures, it's not okay to talk about mental illness. Culturally, it's not appropriate to get that out and it's looked down upon. I wonder whether that might have something to do with the sense of, I don't belong. So in terms of dealing with TCKs, can anyone guess what the most dreaded question for TCKs is of all time? <laughs> yes. Yeah? Over there. What's that? Very close, yeah. I heard it somewhere in the front. So where are you from uh, or where is home? So if you guessed these, you would probably be correct. Although I can't presume to speak for all TCKs, I think it's safe to say that this is probably one of the most difficult questions TCKs get asked, and they asked it a lot. Adrian Bautista, who minored in film and media studies at Georgetown University, made one of my favorite TCK videos uh, that I've found so far on the internet. He created a nine minute documentary, which unfortunately I can't show all nine minutes, <laughs> um, about TCKs as part of his final senior thesis project. And I think it captures pretty well the inst instinctual reaction TCKs feel the second they're asked the question. Let's take a look. I'm what Adrian likes to call a uh, third culture kid, a TCK. I'm Ricky. My name is Victoria Parishan. I'm Jake Wright. My name is Yuko Shimada. My name is Connor Liu. I'm Oliver Silsby. My name is Natalie Muller. My name is Amy Burns. Um, my name is Hannah Lee. So when people ask you the question, where's home, how do you normally answer it? When I, s <sighs> wow. Um. That's a good question. <laughs> um. Uh, it's, dif it's difficult. <laughs> Did you see those sighs? How uncomfortable they looked? They're always looking to the left or looking to the right, trying to find an answer or closing their eyes. One of them, Oliver in the end, even rubbed his forehead and saying, it's difficult. As someone who identifies as a TCK myself, I can definitely relate to their struggle. And I imagine some, for some of you in the audience may be feeling the same way. Navigating the answer to this question is quite tricky. So why is this question so difficult, you might ask. Usually when people ask that question, they want a short answer. They want to understand in just one or two words what culture you grew up in, in which area, to hopefully find quickly and efficiently some things you might find in common to talk about. It also usually addresses the challenge of identifying who they are and reconciling conflicting cultures and identities, and therefore is in fact a question full of complexity. It requires them to spontaneously decide which nationality or culture they identify with at that given moment, which often depends on a variety of factors, including perhaps who is asking. Le Passager, one short TCK documentary, featured many TCKs who moved around a lot, sharing their experiences dealing with their global, globally mobile lifestyles. Here are some of the things they said. Growing up, moving around all over the world, I think my earliest memories are panic and feeling lost. I had to relearn how to make friends because we'd always learned that either we go or they go. And nobody lives there longer than a year or two years. The first person that I found was nice to me, I clamped onto her like a terrier. 
And that was now my best friend forever. And she was terrified of that and ran away real hard. At which point I had to realize that, OK, friends are made gradually. Many TCKs who have moved around a lot when growing up always had the sense that when they finished high school or when their parents' assignment ended, they would go back to their home country and all would be well again. But in fact, that isn't the case. TCKs grew up different than their home country compatriots, and when they returned, they expect to be the same, but end up learning that they are quite different. They also assign expectation, are assigned expectations by their peers to be the same, especially if they look the same or have the same name. And when their peers find out how differently the TCKs thinks compared to the rest of the group who had grown up from the same place all, uh, all their life, they're labeled weird or the foreigner. One of the TCKs from the aforementioned documentary expressed the frustration of trying to fit in quite well. When you're in the majority, everyone's like, you're the same as us. You're supposed to be like this. What's wrong with you? Why aren't you like us? I've tried so hard to fit in. I've really tried. I've done everything I possibly can. I've tried to learn this language. I've tried to be. It's not working. Another explained, I withdrew from the college experience by and large. I think I was probably depressed for the entire four years of college because I just didn't really fit in or like anybody understood me. As a result, the college experience of a returning TCK can be very difficult. My experience. Uh, as for myself personally, I experienced only some of this to a certain degree. I was born in the United States and the capital of DC in the West to a Venezuelan father and American mother who are actually here today, <laughs> uh, whose family heritage can be traced all the way back to the Mayflower. When I was five, I moved to Paris, where I lived for six years attending an American international school. At age 11, I moved once again to Vienna, Austria, where I attended another American international school and graduated high school. And when I finally returned back to the United States, for some reason, I decided to attend a public college in New Jersey. <laughs> My original norm, having classmates from all over the world speaking countless different languages, was radically changed to classmates who were all from only one place. New Jersey. 95% of the student body was from New Jersey, the other 5% out of state, and any international students they may have had were completely negligible. I went from people asking my nationality because asking where are you from in my school was a question commonly understood as being too complicated for most people, to being asked, so, where are you from, north or south? <laughs> being from somewhere else wasn't even an option they gave me. So as a result, even though I had no European passport and I was not European at all, I was labeled the European and often told I had weird or outlandish ideas. Ruth Van Rieken developed a rather interesting explanation of how TCKs are perceived by others because this outward perception can change depending upon where they are. This is Ruth Van Rieken and David Pollock's cultural identity model, or the Van Paul box for short. <laughs> to explain it, I'll use it myself as an example. Van Rieken and Pollock believe that there are four different identities in, that a TCK can have, but only, can, ha, can only be in one at any given time. The first is a foreigner on the top left. They look different and they think different. A good example of this would be the foreign kid, Indian kid with an Indian accent who is the only foreigner in school. His, uh, his school is filled with white Americans who were born and raised in that city their whole life, and so he's quite different. The second is a mirror on the bottom right. They look alike and think alike. That would be an American born and raised in the city white with American parents and white neighborhood neighbors and classmates, et cetera. They're the same. The part where it gets tricky is the adopted, um, the other two. So the adopted identity is someone who looks different but thinks alike. This might be the Asian or Hispanic kid that have, might have immigrant parents or come from a different ethnicity, but was born and raised in, say, the United States. But none of his or her peers think they're actually American. This identity is constantly being judged and perceived as being different, a foreigner, when in reality they think the same as their peers. The last one is hidden immigrant. This identity looks like everyone else, but thinks different. This might be the white kid who fits in with all the other white kids, but keeps on saying weird things and acts weird, and seems to be clueless about all the different cultural norms that are widely known by everyone else. Does this sound familiar to some of you? Yeah. When I was born in the US and spent the first five years of my life in DC, I was the mirror. I looked and thought like everyone else. When I moved to Paris and then to Vienna, I was either a foreigner or a hidden immigrant, depending on if the locals thought I looked French or Austrian enough. Although, who I'm kidding, I was probably the foreigner. <laughs> uh, when I returned to the US, spending the first year in New Jersey, I was definitely a hidden immigrant. I looked alike but thought different, and that quickly earned me the label the European. And any of my non-conforming behavior, things I said, was chalked, was chalked off to being because I never grew up from there. They assigned me the identity of being an outsider, 
but it was a mantle, honestly, I happily wore. Yes, I was different, and I was very proud of that fact. But it also felt lonely at times with no one else I could relate to. TCKs often feel a sense of rootlessness and restlessness, both geographically and culturally. If an American had a TCK upbringing and then returned to the US, he or she may discover what was considered funny or appropriate in one culture may not be the same in the other. So they have to relearn a lot of things like cultural knowledge and customs. My New Jersey friends, for example, were shocked at learning who I, that I didn't know who Gumby was and were amused at how I mispronounced occasional words like lima bean or nachos. By the way, in case you don't know who Gumby is either, he's a character in a children's show made out of clay. Apparently, a lot of American kids have grown up watching Gumby, but when I asked my American mother about him, she had no idea either. <laughs> Another important thing they'll be grappling with, which is sometimes a little less obvious, is a serious sense of loss. At this point, the TCK has just lost all that is known to them, uh, that is known and familiar. Friends, family, relationships, food, music, lifestyle, and status. Whether they recognize it or not, they will experience a strong feeling of grief from this overwhelming sense of loss. When we experience grief on our own, and that grief isn't seen or reflected in others around us, we can feel very alone with that experience, especially if there's no way to work it through. When you move to a new country, you leave that old world behind, but carry with you that feeling of loss. It thus can be very difficult to be present in your new home when you haven't had a chance to process the, leaving the old one behind especially for someone that may be trying to make sense of all the new rules of the culture around them. Culture they may only be just beginning to grasp, but is often made even more difficult with a language barrier. That's really, really hard. So as a result of always moving, it can be hard to settle down or make commitments to school, career, or even friendships or relationships. For me, the idea of settling down somewhere for more than four to six years is very difficult. For my sister, the idea of staying in the same place for six months can be a challenge. Oh, and lost pet and lost work. <laughs> uh, Lois Bashong, a counselor and an adjunct faculty member at Indiana Wesleyan University, explains that we cannot ignore the fact that for, that for those for those who grew up as TCKs, their lives are filled with chronic cycles of separation and loss. Obviously, such cycles are part of the experience for everyone, but for the globally mobile, the cycles are chronic and often relatively sudden and severe. When these losses are not acknowledged, it becomes unresolved grief. Grief that is not acknowledged and left to fester deep in the recesses of our souls can become depression, anger, or anxiety. Ruth Van Rieken, co-author of the TCK Handbook that I mentioned earlier, talks intimately about her experience losing her world in a recent TED Talk she gave. So the day finally came when, I, when it was time to leave, to leave, to go home. I was excited about that in many ways, but what I didn't know was the what day I took that airplane ride and the door closed, I lost my world. We never had a funeral moment because it wasn't my world. And that suppressed grief stayed with her for decades throughout her life. She says, but there was always this place that there was like this silent depression that I could never understand. I found when I had people close to me, when I got married, I would tend to push my husband away just when we got close because I had lost everybody in my life through global mobility. And so I stayed ready for that to happen again. So what can be done? Is this the end of the TCK story? Are, are TCKs simply always going to be left in this feeling of loneliness and depression, constantly questioning who they are and never fitting in? And what happened to Ruth anyways? Well, no, this is definitely not the end of the story. And as for Ruth, she had a moment of catharsis, a silent epiphany, when one day she learned something incredibly important. She learned that she had a name. She learned that she was a TCK, and most importantly, she learned that she was not alone. I found out, when I found out that I had a name, that I was not alone in the feelings that I had had. There were people all over the world who also thought, what's the matter with me, and didn't understand where our story was. She would later write reflective memoirs that told her story and the struggles she dealt with discovering who she really was in her publication of the book, Letters Never Sent. Rachel Jones, a TCK and blog writer, points out that anyone who had read Letters Never Sent or, see, or one of the many other TCK memoirs and anthologies understands the power of naming things. It's one of the most potent aspects of religion. Naming something puts a border around it. It makes it less scary and easier to manage. And it tells us who we are. Ruth Hill Yusim was one of the first to name us. Ruth Hill Yusim. If anyone could be called the mother of TCK research, it would be her. She was the, by the way, this picture was really hard to find. I don't know why. <laughs> 
so enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> she was a pioneer who recognized the trend and through her own experience as a sociologist living abroad, gave TCKs their name. She, went to in, she first went to India in 1952 for a year and then again in 1958 with her husband and boys. It was from these trips that she came up with the idea of a third culture. And then by extrapolation, third culture kid, which was published in the 1960s. By 1960, the US Census published its first ever census of American overseas, Americans overseas, and you seem noticed how there was scarcely a country that didn't have some sort of American living in it. Some of the over 200,000 American school children were attending newly established De Department of Defense schools, missionary school groups had their own schools as well, as did oil companies and their camp schools. And although research was done on these adults living abroad, very little research was conducted on the children of these adults. And thus, you seem filled that gap of knowledge, teaching courses and sitting on doctoral committees of students doing their own research on TCKs. For the next 20 years, you seem would travel to about 76 countries, acting as a consultant and speaker at different overseas schools. She also worked at the university level, directing or making substantial contributions to more than 30 doctoral dissertations, many of which consisted of groundbreaking TCK research. Her latest project, started in 1991, consisted of nearly 700 self-administered questionnaires answered by men and women of all ages, older than 25, around the planet, because she wanted to know just how the adults coped and adapted to their future lives, but also what positive contributions they may have had. Are they an untapped resource, she asked. Would greater recognition of this large hidden dimension of American life, now numbering around four million, increase our opportunities and enrich the lives of others? Some of the statistics she reported in 1993 were staggering. At the time, only 21% of the American population had graduated from a four-year college. In sharp contrast, an incredible 81% of TCKs they interviewed reported earning at least a bachelor's degree. And half of these members went on to get a master's and eventually a doctorate. Uh, the current statistic, by the way, for 2014 is only 32%. So what does this mean? Simply put, the TC, in 1993, TCKs were four times more likely to earn bachelor's degrees. The proverbial TCK torch would then be handed, it would seem, to Ruth Van Rieken and David Pollock. Ruth Van Rieken was an American that grew up for 13 years in Nigeria and is now an adult TCK, or ATCK. ATCK, I always mess it up. She co-authored the, the TCK book with David Pollock, which I think could be considered a TCK handbook or TCK Bible of sorts, because it really brought the term to the public, made it more mainstream and easier to grasp. David Pollock unfortunately passed away in 2004. In his memory, Van Rieken wrote about the invaluable importance he had on the field. Although Ruth Yusim coined the term, she writes, Dave was the person who translated it from academic idea to making a difference in the lives of those who were living in it. Pollock traveled endlessly to schools and organizations, including the UN, trying to create awareness for this global phenomenon. Although initially met with skepticism in how many families the TCK experience was really affected by, he persisted not only in raising awareness, but also by cr offering cr con concrete strategies on how parents and organizations could help these children grow and make sense of their TCK experience. You know, life is sometimes filled with strange coincidences. Van Rieken wrote that Dave literally gave his life for the worldwide community, when in 2004, although he did not feel well, he embarked on what was to be one more tour through Europe, Africa, and Asia. In one of his first stops in Vienna, he went from the stage of the American school to a local hospital where he was diagnosed with pancreatitis from a blocked bile duct. They performed surgery that night to remove the offending gallstone, but the next morning he had a cardiac arrest and died nine days later on Easter Sunday. When he left that stage, he would never know that sitting in the audience watching his speech was the mother of a TCK, who would then tell her son about this being a TCK. Little did he know that when he left that stage, this mother's son would then, 11 and a half years later, be standing in front of you today at the third International Polyglot Conference in New York City, giving his own talk about the TCK phenomenon. Despite the tragic loss of David Pollock, Ruth Van Rieken continued her work. Countless people started contacting her after seminars, via email, over the phone, all asking the same question, am I one too? A lot of them could relate to parts of the TCK profile, but didn't have the same experience of going into another culture with their parents due to a parent's career choice. And because the world is an incredibly complex place, becoming ever more global and interconnected, Van Rieken felt that she had 
to create a new model to understand many different types of cultural experiences, which she called cross-cultural kins, or CCKs. So sorry, Ellen, you have to remember a new acronym. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go back to the original definition for a minute. Originally, Ruth Hill Yusim found four different types of TCKs, a TCK experience. The foreign service kids, the corporate brats, the missionary kids, and the military brats. Many of these TCK types had their own little self-contained worlds, such as military brats living on a military base with their own commissary food and own TV channels, etc. But the world has changed a lot since then, and the communities that used to be well-defined are blending into the world around them a lot more. To help understand what exactly a TCK is, Ruth Van Rieken explains that the following are two important aspects for virtually every third culture kit. They are the following. Being raised in a generally cross-cultural world, and being raised in a highly mobile world. So that moving part is really important. They also have um, often the following attributes. Distinct differences, either physically or mentally. Expected repatriation to their home country. Privileged lifestyles, such as perks like a commissary. Some even have domestic service, chauffeurs, fancy TV, etc. And uh, system identity, where they're representing something bigger than themselves, like uh, government, God, or the company. So what if you relate to some of these aspects, but not others? I have a friend that asked me the same question. Her parents are both Korean, but she was born and raised in California and never really moved. Does she still count? Another friend told me that she spent her entire life living in the US, but she would constantly move from one city to the next, and thus could relate to the moving part, but the cultures weren't necessarily different. To account for these similar yet different experiences, Van Rieken developed the term cross-cultural kid as a mega umbrella under which there were 10 different types. One of these types, the traditional TCK, was what provided her lens to look at the different types of TC CCKs and how they might be similar and different. And here are the 10 types. And I won't go through all of them because there are a lot. <laughs> um, but you have bicultural, uh, multicultural, multiracial, immigrants, educational CCKs, refugees, borderlanders, minorities, and domestic CCKs. Uh, Van Rieken notes that as more research and discovery is done, more categories might actually be added in the future. But this is what we have so far. Also, you can fall under multiple categories. <sighs> Finally, so now I like to play a game of sorts. TZKs actually aren't just random, obscure people or people like me living in the shadows. Many of them you may have heard of before, but you never knew who they were. The game is as follows. Can you recognize who these TZKs are from their childhood? Also, once you hear their stories, can you guess what kind of CCK umbrella they might fall under? There are three people to recognize, and each person is worth 1,000 points. But <laughs> the points don't matter. That's right, the points are just like the word international in International House of Pancakes. <laughs> it's story time, let's get started. The first person we have on the list is called Farouk Bulsara. Here's a picture of him smiling in his prime, being watched over by an African nanny in the garden of his home in colonial Zanzibar, where his parents had lived at the time. His family of Parsis followers the Zoroastrian religion, whose ancestors came from Persia. And although he never talked much about his heritage in the media, family was an essential part of his identity. His father was born in India and moved to Zanzibar, where Bulsara was born and raised during his early childhood. Then a colony, it is now part of Tanzania. When Bulsara was eight, he, sent, he was sent to St. Peter's, a boarding school near his parents' old home in Bombay, which is now Mumbai, where he showed a natural talent for piano. He graduated from the school and returned home where he stayed until 1963 when a revolution followed Zanzibar's independence. The largely poor Africans who were rioting targeted the wealthier Indian population. Thus, Farouk and his family fled to London in 1964 where they swapped a life of privilege with servants to one of a semi-detached home in the suburbs. There, Farouk went to Isleworth Polytechnic to study graphic design, but as music already entranced him, he became increasingly famous playing a band. And although fame took the forefront of his life, he said that he never forgot himself for his background and complex identity. His mother reports, being a Parsi meant he identified more with his Persian ancestry than India, where his parents were brought up and he was educated. His mother also added that he was a Parsi and he was proud of that, but he wasn't particularly religious. At the height of his fame, Farouk Basar wanted nothing more than to sit in the kitchen of his mother as, he, as his mother cooked for him and to be as normal as possible. Nowadays, Farouk Bulsara is much better known as Freddie Mercury. To all of his fans, he was a flamboyant and very British rock star and prominent lead, uh, prominent lead of the band Queen. As a member of Queen, he was inducted posthumously into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2001 and has been voted one of the greatest singers in the history of popular music. 
because he moved multiple times during his upbringing, having been born in Zanzibar and moving at an early age first to Bombay, Bombay then back to Zanzibar and finally London, and because his cultures, the cultures he was surrounded by were presumably very, very different from one another, Freddie Mercury is a great example of a TCK. And I imagine he must have had a difficulty answering the question, where are you from, as well. <laughs> Second person we have on the list, you may recognize a bit from her teenage years. In many ways, this young woman had a difficult upbringing. Born in Boston, her mother is a German-Swedish model born in Mexico City, and her father is an American Buddhist writer and academic who also teaches Buddhism at Columbia, and after studying with the current Dalai Lama, Tenzin Gyatso, became his close friend and the first American monk at the, of the Tibetan Buddhist religion, a tradition. Both her, family, Robert, and her, both her father, Robert, and her mother, Nena, generally frowned upon Americana and didn't encourage her to engage in ordinary American pursuits. At the age of one and again at 11, she moved to, Indo to the Indo-Himalayan town of Almora for a year, but the rest of her life was spent growing up in Amherst, Massachusetts and Woodstock, New York. Her house was often visited by Tibetan refugees, even the Dalai Lama, with the family constantly needing to bring their own ideas to the table as they discussed philosophy. She changed schools often, and thus often ha felt like the new kid, a fact that wasn't helped by her unusual name and unusual parents. She tried to call herself Kelly or Linda to avoid being teased. And because she also looked different, because she was taller, bigger eyes, bigger ears, bigger feet, bigger hands, she grew up the outsider. Due to her mother's strong Euro Eurocentricity, she rarely felt American, seeking out extracurricular activities to help ease her feelings of depression. Nothing worked except acting, and soon she started her own acting career and taking classes in New York City. As many of you may have guessed, this person is none other than Uma Thurman who has since won a Golden Globe and was nominated for multiple award mo for awards for movies such as Kill Bill and Pulp Fiction. Despite the, fight, despite the fact that she had spent most of her life in the US, the fact that she moved a lot, spent some time abroad, and had parents whose culture was very different from that of her friends and classmates makes her a TCK. The last person I'd like to talk about is this little boy. <laughs> you might recognize him. He was born in Honolulu, Hawaii, to an American mother and a Kenyan father. His grandfather on his mother's side had marched across Europe in General Patton's army, while his grandmother worked on a bomber assembly line. After going to school on the GI Bill, they both settled in Hawaii as well. The little boy's father was born of Luo ethnicity and had grown up herding goats in Africa, eventually earning a scholarship to go to college in Hawaii. Unfortunately, when the boy was still an infant, his father separated from his mother and moved to Massachusetts to go to Harvard for a PhD. His mother later remarried in, to an Indonesian when he was three, and he moved a couple years later to Jakarta, where he lived with his new dad until he was 10, when his mother sent him back to Hawaii to live with his grandparents for a year or two before she could rejoin him. He would attend Punahu College, uh, Punahu School, a private college prep school, where he quickly noticed that he was one of the only students in the entire grade who was black. Not only did he feel different, but he looked different as well. Eventually, he would come to settle down in Hawaii, graduating from high school there and moving to New York to go to Columbia University for college. He would later get his master's in law at Harvard, become a US senator from Illinois, and finally become the first black president of the United States. Now, I know this one is really difficult. <laughs> so for those of you who are still guessing this point, I'm still, of course, talking about Barack Obama. So how many points did you get? How did you label each person? For Freddie Mercury, it seems he might fit the refugee and educational CCK umbrella. As for Uma Thurman, you could probably fit the domestic TCK as well as bicultural, although I suppose you could say she was also a TCK when she went to Almora. Finally, Barack Obama, who might be one of the most famous TCKs ever, he's bicultural, biracial, and a traditional TCK. He was also the child of parents who were divorced twice. Well, his mother was divorced twice, which is a TCK-related question that even Ruth Van Rieken isn't quite sure how to categorize. Freddie Mercury and Uma Thurman might be harder to understand how their upbringing and TCK life experience affected them, but we actually have a bit of an idea about how it was affected Obama because he wrote a book called Dreams from My Father. In it, he describes quite accurately the difficulty that others have of understanding him. When people who don't know me well, black or white, discover my background, I see the split second adjustments they have to make, the searching of my eyes for some telltale sign. They no longer know who I am. Privately, I guess in my, uh, my troubled heart, I suppose. The mixed blood, the divided soul, the ghostly image of the tragic mulatto trapped between two worlds. Although there are many different types of CCKs, there is one piece they have in common, which is the cross-cultural experience during the developmental years. This means ages 
from ages 0 to 18. Why is this so important? Because it is during this time that an identity is developed, a set of cultural and societal norms that help define who a person is. As a result, it's a lot easier for children to be influenced by, but also accept and adapt to different cultures and traditions than it is for an adult. Okay. Um, as, uh, right. Uh, so thus, as parents struggle to understand local expressions of culture, the children ex immediately accept them since they don't have anything to come in conflict with as the parents do. They, usually, they essentially have a blank slate on which they can paint the canvas of culture to form their identity. But along with the ability to adapt and learn comes the difficulty of not feeling like they don't fully belong to any, any one culture. This is a constant fear that some TCKs developed, including Obama himself. He writes, fear, the constant crippling fear that I didn't belong somehow, that unless I dodged and hid and pretended to be something I wasn't, I would forever remain an outsider with the rest of the world black and white, always standing in judgment. But this is a feeling of being different, which ironically makes TCKs feel they have something in common. So I'm gonna skip now to acculturation, which plays a large part in the success or failure of the TCK to acquire the local language. Language plays a huge part in the role of expressing an identity or a desired identity, and thus being able to acquire the local language or even the mannerisms of speaking is very important for the budding TCK. Language can be used to determine a nationality, an accent, and can identify a region or socioeconomic status, which the speaker may be judged upon. For TCKs joining a new class, the challenge to learn all the cultural linguistic traditions can be very difficult indeed, but a challenge they need to overcome in order to understand the values, notions, and ideas of the people who are, who are from there. Um, and there is also a strong connection between cultural language and thought. So if you're seeing uh, John McWhorter later today, you might be able to see what he has to think on the matter. Um, there's an important aspect of language acquisition, um, which is co comprehensible input. Um, this theory was developed in Krashen's input hypothesis, which stated that, that comprehensible input is determined by the equation i plus one. We would move from our current level i to the next level i plus one only if the constant of the input is one level higher, but no more than one and also isn't too low. So basically it has to be exactly perfect for the uh, language learner to require. It has to be just ready, not too hard, not too easy. Um, but the problem is that um, there's also an effective filter, which is if they're depressed, if they're lonely, if they're too hungry or too sad or too tired or too thirsty, they won't be ready to learn the language. Um, so, these, so these feelings that stop you from learning a language can be very common in TCKs, uh, especially if they have anxiety, which is often a trait found in TCKs because they have to move between worlds. Um, I'm gonna jump over this because we're running out of time. <laughs> uh, one great way to fight against these problems are international schools. Uh, international schools play a vital role in the cultural and linguistic development of TCKs as well as their upbringing. English is usually the lingua franca. It provides a safe space for multicultural exchanges. Um, this results in high English proficiency and greater tolerance for English variations, which can result in a bilingual identity. Equality is a core value in international schools, um, and this results in um, more values being more accepted and being able to be different of different cultures. And they also have activities to promote this value of equality amongst cultures. So for example, cultural fairs, athletic events, model the UN, food fairs. Food fairs was one of my personal favorites, because I could try food from all over the world. <laughs> um, so, but there is a difficulty in returning home. Uh, it can be a challenge to acculturate from multicultural environment to a monocultural environment. And this may result in distant orientation and detachment. Um, it also may result in a TCK seeking out international friends instead. Um, so for example, when I moved back to New Jersey from being, living abroad, everyone was from New Jersey and I felt like I couldn't fit in, I didn't relate to anybody. So I actually moved a year later to Boston to attend a school with many more international students who, with whom I could relate to. Um, but are these only, the only problems with TCKs? Do they just have these, all these uh, challenges to overcome? Well, not exactly. There are many TCK advantages. Expanded worldview, three-dimensional worldview, sense of ownership, uh, enhanced knowledge of intercultural communication, um, the ability to develop friends that, cro that cross ethnic, racial, and political boundaries. So for example, um, Palestinian and Israeli friends, or um, Indian, uh, well, different friends across different political boundaries. Um, so there are many different advantages. And if I can leave you with anything today, is that obviously language fluency is one of the best assets to TCKs. 
And you make sure that the pros outweigh the cons. There are a lot of different advantages that TCKs can walk away with. Uh, Theo Roxon is one who believes that TCKs can use their difference to make a difference. So if you're into a TCK, anticipate how people might perceive you, learn how to deal with relocating, accept the grief you feel from leaving your world behind, leverage your many strengths, and pursue a career that uses your language or that uses your cross-cultural communication skills. Take inspiration from Tayo. Take inspiration from Ruth Van Rieken and David Pollock and Ruth Hill Yusim. The world needs more TCKs to realize their incredible potential. And when they realize they can achieve anything, even be the President of the United States, then they can truly change the world for the better. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.